We're all standing around. Right. Talking in the morning, doing our hallway duty. And then he whips out a banana and starts eating it and nasty smell. And oh, and I'm seeing like, like you can't eat a banana without smacking. So it's like, I you you know what I'm talking about because you probably eat those nasty things and the whole time I'm I like, had two bananas Whoa. today I had I had an actual banana and I had a banana shake and they were both delicious <laughs> oh banana shake oh that is like I don't <laughs> when I go to hell that's what I will have to drink for eternity are banana shakes oh have you ever had a banana split no oh, no they're so good no oh yeah oh. And then, you know what I think he did? Hmm. Instead of just like throwing it out on the ground, because it's biodegradable, he threw it in the bathroom trash can. So it was like taunting me when I was throwing away my paper towels after washing my hands. <laughs> it was like sitting there staring at me. <laughs> if you guys didn't know, Crypto here has a fear of bananas. So covering a once perfect day for banana fish with you guys is absolute torture for him. Every time we say banana, 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 Bam. say the B it, word. It just grosses. Bee fish. It just grosses him out. So bear with bee us today. Fish. If you guys are looking to know more about this story by Mieko Kawakami, <sighs> stick around and let's talk about it. Your banana una. <laughs> I can't even speak. I'm so flustered. Welcome to the Codex Cantina, where I am Una. And I am Flustered Crypto. <laughs> if you are new to the Codex Cantina, we take a conversational approach to the stories, picking some of the most important that have influenced even today's writers. If you're down for a conversational approach to literature, hit that subscribe button to join us. And as always, we start off with publication information. A Once Perfect Day for Banana Fish was published in 2012 in Monkey Business. We will leave a link down in the description where you can read for free. And our copy was translated by Hitomi Yoshio. Now, what's interesting is Mieko Kawakami is not just an author. She is a singer, songwriter, author, and best known for her more recent release, Breasts and Eggs, which I was actually kind of interested in us checking out because it had super polarizing reviews in terms of what people liked or disliked, which could arguably be applied to J.D. Salinger's original story, A Perfect Day for Banana Fish, which creeped a lot of people out. Is that another short story or a poem or song? What What is it? That's that's a full novel that she wrote. It's she she oh, she oh wow she writes in more of the the feminist space and monkey business is all about bringing contemporary Japanese authors. Uh, it, out in the form of short stories. So you subscribe to it and you get, you know, periodically uh, a, a release of a whole bunch of different Japanese contemporary writers, which is really cool. And she's a pretty young author too. She's very accomplished for such a, a young individual. Yeah. And it's, this is such an interesting project, right? Because you have an author from a long time ago, a post World War II vet talking about this experience of innocence and fitting back into society and, and, and reintegration coming back from war. And here she is decades later thinking about this girl, you know, who probably, if this story were real, would have grown up to be a much older woman by now. So what Kawakami does is takes this girl from this story, a girl that went out with a man, had her feet kissed, strangely enough, pushed back to shore after spending some time with him. And uh, a very strange moment in, in Salinger's story. But the, the question Kawakami asked was, well, what effect did this have on young Sybil, three-year-old Sybil, hanging out with some dude trying to reintegrate after the war, having her feet kissed? What impact did that have on her? And that's what we kind of explore today in a very interesting short story from her. The short answer is, I think that it has no impact whatsoever, which is kind of heartbreaking to where the Sybil, it doesn't matter to her life whatsoever, because as a reader, you're thinking, whoa, it's kind of creepy that this guy is kissing on this little girl's feet and playing with her in the water, and he has, it's not his daughter, but it ends up being the most important day of his life being the last day of his life, where to her, it's just, oh, I remember playing in the water with some guy, you know, when I was a little tiny kid, as she's reminiscing about her life. And it's kind of heartbreaking all over again. Well, I think we're going to have to discuss this, because it sounds like we strong, I strongly disagree with that statement. Um, the, my takeaway from the story was that it was deeply impactful on her, because everything in her life just kind of has something that revolves around that singular day in her life. 
right? We have all these quotes in the beginning where the old woman on the bed at the end of her life, the true absolute end, in a faint flicker, she dreams a dream all in yellow, a yellow hot summer's day. And you see, we keep coming back to this, the end of her life, right? Because that day was the end of Seymour Glass, the old war vet's name that day. And yellow comes up several times through the story that it seems like how it's, many times how many I didn't times count. i didn't count for once but it has to be close to 50 times it, but i think what we're supposed to take from a reader's perspective is that this day was important to her because she keeps thinking about that finality and she keeps coming back to yellow if you remember yellow was an important color and blue to Salinger's story and it's something that it's just colorizing all of her memories because she keeps coming back to it yeah, it could just be a happy coincidence that she's reflecting back on her life. And, you know, when she gets older, maybe she finds out that he died that day. And it does have an impact on her as she reflects back upon it. But I think the day itself might not necessarily have a huge impact. The The memory of it does. And that's something that we can talk about is the, the false memories that she may be experiencing as a little kid and the influence of that later in her life. Well, do you remember how she described the water? Is it yellow? <laughs> no. The young man and the old woman enter the sea. And that's another thing. It's kind of weird how she doesn't remember herself being three-year-old. It's like she's injecting herself as an old woman, almost like reversing the age gap where before she was significantly younger. Now she's significantly older in this memory, which is interesting that she gets older, but the memory is preserved and keeps you know coming back to. But we have the, the young man and the old woman enter the sea. The waves are soft glass particles. And I couldn't help but notice that she called the sea glass because that was that man's name, Seymour Glass. And I feel like she's interjecting through the story all these little subtle nods to how important that man and that day was to her life without her even realizing it. It's just coming in and out of her life. That's a good point. I think my view of that is that while this day ends up being important. I don't think it, it's only important in retrospective because you said that what she's doing is, is that a lot of times think about this, when you think of a memory and you think of your, your favorite Christmas, or when I think of my favorite Christmas, and I've told this story before where I'm a little kid and I'm opening up my Super Nintendo in 1991. When I think back of that memory and I'm envisioning it right now in my head, I still picture myself as a little crypto. I don't have a beard. I don't have any gray hairs. Uh, but she is looking back on this memory and she's envisioning her 90-year-old self in the water with that man. And I think that that kind of points out that she is reflecting back upon how important this day has become to her, mm -hmm. but wasn't necessarily at the time period. Mm -hmm. And so while I agree with you, I also kind of disagree with you as well, that it becomes important as she looks back upon her life. And not to say that, you know, one of us is right or wrong. I just think it's kind of the interpretation of how our memories change and how they can influence, uh, you know, our, our choices in life. You know what I kind of thought? This is, this is totally off topic. But you know how, like, in terms of movies, Rogue One from Star Wars is the ultimate retcon to a huge flaw in the original Star Wars. Like, everybody's like, why would they put, like, this this exhaust port that could easily destroy this multi-trillion billion dollar project, right? And then you have this really cool retcon to explain why Galen Erso did it. I, I really liked, in a very less ambitious way, this story when she talks about how they bumped feet when they were playing pianos. And if you remember, I always wondered why Seymour Glass was so, like, mad when he got in the elevator at the end of the Salinger story about yelling about don't look at my feet and I can't help but wonder if he thought feet were important because that's the only part of his body that touched innocence to to the Salinger story's point is brought up in this stories so it's a good retcon for allowing you to continuation of the story it does feel like it fills in some of those gaps of things that you were missing. It doesn't answer the big question of really maybe why he killed himself, but it does allude to that idea of her reflecting back upon her innocence and what maybe influence she had on him, or maybe she's thinking back, could I have had more influence on this individual? Yeah, that's a good point, because it's not really his story the way Kawakami explores it, right? We, the narration was really interesting for me because it starts off with the in our eyes, right? So, so we as a society are, are looking upon Sybil, 
But did you notice the narration change through this piece? Yeah, it's kind of strange because you start off with this specific third person, right? And then it goes to I about, I don't know, halfway-ish through the story and almost all the way to the end in like the last three or four paragraphs, it switches back again. And I'm not sure exactly what her purpose was, but it is a little bit jarring. Yeah, I, I felt I noticed the same thing that it's kind of like sandwiched in between. We have all the I usages to almost change the narration. And on the outside, it's the hour where we're judging upon that. And you also had those weird shifts of how she was projecting herself as an old woman into her old memories that uh, it definitely made me kind of pause to think about what maybe Kawakami is is saying about how we view ourselves in our past or how we justify our own actions. Um, now, you started to bring up a point there about uh, what did this man's life do to impact her? And I think that's a hard one to answer, but I, I think she keep com- keeps coming back to this day and finality of this day, the absolute end, the very, very end, right? That's a clear point. And it, it's got to be connected to how this was Seymour's last day of life. This was literally his last day was her, him kissing her feet. I think that it's kind of the point of both stories, maybe, where he's regretting things and choices life that he has made because of World War II. And then here we have her regretting that she could have done more to potentially save his life if she had said something different or kept him there a little bit longer, just a few seconds longer. Maybe he would have bumped into somebody, had a conversation, made different choices, gone to the bar or taken a different elevator, had to take the stairs instead of the elevator. And then when he gets into the room and he has a conversation with his wife or what if he gets up there late and the wife's in the bathroom, that changes the whole narrative of the story. And I think that she is maybe questioning, should she have made something different? And I think regret is heavy in her heart as she's looking back on her life as an old lady. What makes you think that, uh, that she was leading towards regret? I think in the story, it comes down to the usage of these adverbs and adjectives. They're very aggressive. You have words like the enduring hot sand, unreachable, irritating, pressing. It just, it it fuels feelings at this point in the story. So would you say she maybe resents the day and not taking action on that day? Yeah, I think that the man and her do have a connection of some sort, and she's realizing that this is an important day in her life. It was a super important, obviously, day in his life as he's going to end his life, and she forgets to say goodbye to him, and he just kind of, poof, is gone, and she's missing that closure in her life, which a lot of us don't get, and I think a lot of us can relate to, you know, with a pet or a loved one or anything in our lives where we don't get to have that final say-so. That's an interesting point. What I noticed more of was the cyclical nature of this story too, right? Here she is finally reaching the end of her lifetime, right? The absolute end, <laughs> as they say several times in this. <laughs> and you have quotes like yeah. this again and again. The old woman calls out the young man's name, you know, etc. The swimming tube just above his head. What a knowing look it has. It's laughing in the shape of a ring. The inevitable sequence of coming in and going out. The chair with the girl passes by. The old woman repeats the young man's name. So in this quote, you have like again and again, a ring, which is a circular shape. You've got an inevitable sequence coming in and out, the you know the waves coming in and out. And then you even talk about the woman repeating the man's name. So it's kind of like that concept of you keep coming back to it in the same way that this woman has kept coming back to this experience she had when she was three years old. I think that comes back to my point of regret is she keeps coming back to this because it's something that she could have made a different decision in her life that would have altered not only her life, but his life. And I think it comes back to that idea of, you know, her eyes being half closed is that she's not seeing everything that's happening because of her childhood innocence. And as an old lady, as she now has all these experiences, she's able to reflect back, you know, better upon that and think, man, if I would have done this differently you know, it would have made the outcome much different, uh, you know, in the retrospect and that, you know, life is cyclical and we we, we continually make the wrong decisions over and over, you know, despite the fact that we know that they're bad for us. Yeah. Very interesting story. This is, this is our first Kawakami story. I, I will leave a link to other talks from Japanese authors down below. I would definitely say I enjoyed this story, but it definitely challenged me on a different level. It was so much more loose than I think the the Salinger story was, right? Like Kawakami wasn't afraid to just kind of like really just explore and use words to convey emotions and themes. 
but was like so removed from like making it concrete that it, it was uh it was definitely a challenging read i kind of thought from that perspective to kind of move into our subjective ratings, I also don't know if I want to give this one a number because you hit it nail on the head. This felt challenging. This is what I felt like is a sequel that is not asked for, right? So you have a a, a movie or story, a play or whatever, and then there's an ending, not one that you're happy with, and then somebody comes in and tries to fill in the gaps and give you too much information, and it takes away from the mystery a little bit. I kind of feel like that's what's happening here, and I don't know if I wanted that, although I'm happy I have it now. Did I necessarily need it? I don't know, and so I, I, I'm, I'm troubled on giving this one one of our subjective ratings this time, so no number from me this time. You know what, and it's kind of like, rate Rogue One without seeing the other Star Wars. Can you do it? Yeah, you could, but the the emotional weight of, of 30, 40 years of having this really funny, you know, obvious flaw in the movie of, like, why would there be a single shot to, like, the, to destroy this thing, uh... You miss some of the emotional resonance, and, and and isn't that true with this story too? Let's say there's some people out there, you know, much older than us, or maybe have, had read it when they were younger, uh, had gone through years of this mystery in their lives of of the Salinger story, and maybe that connected with them in some way, maybe not. And then to have kind of like this really interesting way to kind of maybe retcon in some things and and maybe explore it from her perspective, I think is fascinating. But to rate it by itself without that backwards context just seems kind of strange. Could you enjoy? Yeah, you absolutely could. But I think you really need to see, you know, the original Star Wars trilogy before you see Rogue One in the same way that I think you need Salinger's story as a bedrock to get the full emotional gravity of what this story laid on top of it, in my opinion. They go hand in hand. And to stick with your Star Wars theme, this is over-explanation of the Force through Metachlorians. It's kind of the same (laughs) idea. And and I'm not trying to say that this story is bad or negative. It just, it feels like, do I need it? Well, you do if you read the first one, is, is what I'm trying to say. Okay, okay. Well, all right, guys, thank you so much for joining us for today's talk. If you're down for literature discussions in a conversational way, hit that subscribe button to join us. We post videos every Monday and Thursday with a bonus video on Tuesdays. Una out. Peace.